we make lots of mistakes in life, don't we? And uh, in, 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 rela- in particular, in relationship with each other. Uh, we, man, it's so easy for us to annoy each other. Uh, you know, we've all got pet peeves, don't we? You know, we could all probably stand up here and talk for five minutes about the things that annoy us. Um, but, you know, when we're, when we're in a relationship with each other, uh, we, have to learn to, we have to learn to love one another, and we have to learn to submit to one another, as Shane said. We have to learn to be patient with each other because we're all flawed, right? We're all, we're all struggling. We're all wounded in some way. And, uh, and, and being in a relationship, no, no matter what kind of relationship it is, being in a relationship with, with other people is hard. In our campus ministry this year, we're, we're doing a series uh, on relationships, and we're, we're just trying to help our students understand uh, how to how to navigate relationships in a healthy way, in a way that in a way that honors God. Uh, and so, I'm going to share with you just uh, some thoughts today that uh, that actually some of the, some of this I shared Wednesday night. Uh, Anna Dale, I'm sorry, some of this is going to be repeat for you, um, but it's just kind of what's on my heart right now, and so I want to I want to share it with you. Um, I'll, I'll admit, by the way, I'm really tired right now. School just started, and uh, for the last three weeks, it's been very, very intense. Uh, so, so if I fall asleep up here, David, just <laughs> just, nudge, just nudge me. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I remember being about five years old, and my my grandma was uh, babysitting me and my brother, and uh, and we did something. You know, we're all you know. We all always done something to get in trouble, and my grandma said she's going to spank me, and uh, <clears throat> and so she picked up my she picked up my gun belt, you know, off my you know my my cowboy gear, you know, and she's going to and I, I said, now, Grandma, <laughs> you can't whip me with my gun belt. <laughs> I mean that'd just be that just that'd just be insulting. You can't you can't take a cowboy's gun belt and whip him with it. <laughs> So you know, the, these uh, these struggles in relationships they start early, don't they? You know, and you're fighting with your fighting with your brother. You know, almost out of the womb, you're you know you're you're squabbling and fussing and so forth. I had a I had this random guy come by three or four years ago. He came by my office one day, just off the street. He had this cardboard box, and it was it was somewhere around sometime around April. Mother's Day was coming up, and he said, "Yeah, I'm just." Uh, I wonder if you're interested in buying a Mother's Day present. I got some stuff here. I said, well, what, I mean, what you got? He said, well, I got some cologne and I got some tasers. <laughs> <laughs> and I started laughing. He said, well, it's not, you know, it, they're, they're pink. They're for the ladies, you know. <laughs> I said, a taser for a Mother's Day present? <laughs> But I started thinking about it later. I, I, you know, I said, I don't think I need a taser or anything. Um, but I started thinking about it later. I thought, you know, for moms and grandmas, a taser might actually come in handy. You know, that way, instead of the gun belt, she can just, you know, pop. <laughs> you know, relationships are hard, right? It, we, we, you know, we, we, we annoy each other. We get on each other's nerves. We pester each other. All you people that out on the highway, on these four-lane roads, if you're that guy that drives in the left lane clogging all the traffic up, you need to repent because... Because that, that's at the top of my list. If I had a taser, <laughs> citizen's arrest, baby. <laughs> yeah, okay, well, anyway, relationships are hard, right? Um, I'm gonna, I want to I wanna, I wanna give you a glimpse, though, of where we're headed. In other words... You know, you alluded to this at the beginning of, of, of worship, David. You said, you know, at some point, one of these days, there won't be any more tears, right? That's, that's where we're headed. There won't be, you know, at some point in the future, there won't be any need for, you know, for whippings or tasers or, or uh, getting annoyed. I, w- I want to read from Revelation 21, 1 through 4, and then I want to read from Revelation 22, 1 through 5. Revelation 21, 1 through 4, it says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. 
I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. Now chapter 22, 1 through 5. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as, cris as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing twelve crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the trees are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. That's where we're headed. It's pretty beautiful, isn't it? One of the things in, in that reading, one of the things that probably most people recognize or grab a hold of is what you said earlier, David, that the concept that there, there won't be any more tears. Why do we shed tears? I mean, for lots of different reasons, of course. But if you think about it, the vast majority of the tears that we shed are related to relationships. Either because someone has passed on who, who we loved, and God says, when we get here, death will have died, and we won't have any more tears because of that. But, but, but also many of the tears we shed in this life are because of the wounds that we inflict on one another, aren't they? I, I, I know, I've heard enough of you ladies' stories from John 3.17 and, and lots of other stories of people who, who have struggles with addictions and things like that to know that so often um, those, those addictions are rooted in, in issues related to relationships that hurt, that wounded, that caused pain that you couldn't seem to get beyond. And, uh, and whether it's drugs or whether it's alcohol or whether it's um, you know just being absorbed in entertainment or overworking or whatever it may be. We, you know, we all have our own drug, don't we? Whether it's actually drugs or something else that we use to sort of medicate ourselves. And so often those wounds are, are related to relationships. It's parents and children, it's siblings, it's uh, of certainly husbands and wives, it's neighbors, it's friends, it's coworkers, it's roommates, it's classmates, it's fellow church members. And the question is, how do, we, how do we navigate those relationships in a way in which this doesn't happen, in a way in which we don't wound each other to the point that we have to find some way to deal with it? What if there was a way that you could be in a relationship where that, where that doesn't happen? Um, <clears throat> one of the things that I notice about this reading, I know I'm, it feels like I'm jumping to a new subject here, but follow me. One of the things that I notice about this reading is the fact that it's in a city. He says we're going to be in a city. I don't know how literally to take that, but that's what it says. It says, in the next life we'll be in a city. How many of you have lived in a city? I mean, a pretty, pretty good-sized city for, for any length of time. What's, uh, a couple of you tell me, what's the, what's the best part about living in a city? Okay, <laughs> lots of restaurant choices. What else? Okay, everything's close. Okay, access. Okay. Okay, lots of people. Okay. All right. What would you say would be the worst parts of living in a city? <laughs> What's that? 
Okay, so sounds like the best part of a city is people. The worst part of a city is people. <laughs> a lot of tra Yeah, well, and the traffic's because why? There's a lot of people there, right? Okay, yeah, okay, absolutely. But I want, I want, I want you to think about this, because I, I, I live out in the country, out, outside of Bono, uh, Monica and Emma and I have, I mean, we live, we live in a house uh, out on 10 acres, sur completely surrounded by oak trees. I've got a neighbor across the road, but when, when the leaves are on the trees, you can't s even see their house. Uh, and the, the other three sides, I don't have anybody. It's just totally, almost totally secluded. And we love that out there because it's, because it's peaceful, quiet, it's, it's, uh, it's calm, it's kind of like a retreat. Uh, for us. But one of the reasons that people live out like that, and I bet some of you do too, you live out, I mean, <laughs> if you live anywhere close to Rimmel, there's not that many people, right? <laughs> you know, like, at least not compared to a city. Um, and, and some of us prefer that because we like the peace, we like the quiet, we like, you know, we like to not be, um, you know, surrounded by traffic and craziness and noise. Um, but what if, because, and, 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 and so when I read this text, when it says we're headed to a city, I, uh, you know, and sometimes I think, oh, I don't, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure about that. I'm not, I'm not really a city guy. You know, I always grew up in the country, and that's what I like. But one of the reasons that you, one of the reasons that you, you're drawn to living out in the country by yourself is people. <laughs> because people can be hard to live with. People can be annoying, can be frustrating. They, it can be, you know, when you're living right next to people, you have to, you have to get along with them, <laughs> right? Or try to. But, but check this out. What if, what if every relationship, every relationship that you have was perfect? Then, if every relationship that you had was beautiful and life-giving and it, and it flourished, would it not be your, everybody's choice to live in a city where you're surrounded by people? Because every relationship is perfect. If every relationship is perfect, you want, you want more of it. Bring, it. bring it to me. I want people on top of me, below me, around me. I love it because every relationship is life-giving. Every re relationship feeds me and nourishes me and reflects God. Isn't that beautiful? That's where we're headed. So even for a country boy like me, living in a city like that, Sounds really good. But how do you, how do you, how do you get there? Imagine you're standing at the gate of that city. You know, the, and, and apparently it will be gates of pearl. <laughs> and apparently St. Peter will be standing there. I don't think that's in the Bible anywhere, but you know, that's the, you know, that's the metaphor. Um, so you walk up there, and, and, and Peter kind of lets you have a glimpse in. And you look in, and there's all these people everywhere. And they're all smiling. They're all filled with joy and peace and happiness. But the problem is, if they let me in, then it messes it all, <laughs> messes it all up. How do you, so how do you get in? Like, what's the, I'm not talking about the process of salvation. What I'm talking about is learning to be in relationships in a way that reflects what happens there. Remember when Jesus prayed and he says, he said, in, in what we call the Lord's Prayer, he says, um, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus is saying, we need to pray for heaven to come to earth. 
we need to pray for whatever exists there where every relationship is perfect to be a reality here. And you're thinking, well, that's impossible. Because if, if there was, say, a perfect neighborhood, a perfect office, a perfect church, if I show up, I'm going to mess it up, right? And that's true. But is it, not, is it not possible, as we look to Jesus, as we fix our eyes on Jesus, and as we engage in relationships with each other in a way that honors him, is it not possible, then, for churches like this, or for the offices or neighborhoods or schools that you're a part of to more reflect heaven than they do now because of your choice to bring heaven to earth by the way you treat each other. And what is the key to that? What does that mean? What does it mean to be in relationships in a way that, that's heavenly? What would a quote, heavenly relationship look like? Well, there's lots to unpack about that that we don't have time for. I, I just want to tell you the, the, one, the one central key. Jesus says, and this is from Mark chapter 1, Jesus begins his ministry. What we just read from Revelation, that's where we're headed. That's, that's the end. Let me, let me read you the beginning. This was the beginning of the journey that Jesus is asking us all to go on. The very first thing that Jesus says in the Gospel of Mark as he begins his, his ministry, this is the very first thing he says, Mark 1, 14 and 15. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. The very first thing Jesus says is, the kingdom of God has come near, so repent. What's the kingdom of God? Well, there's a lot, to, a lot we could say there, but to put it really simply, a kingdom is a place where a king rules. And so the kingdom of God is where God rules, where God reigns. And he says it's near. The kingdom of God is near. It's like, David, it's come up to your doorstep, but how do you get in? How does it go from near to here? Repent. Okay, what does that mean? Well, usually we think of repent as, you know, change your behavior, which is true. You know, do a 180. But inherent in repentance is that concept that no longer will I run my own life. Jesus, we call Jesus Savior and we call him Lord. Jesus saves us from our sins. He makes it possible for us to be in right relationship with God. But he's also Lord, which means he runs your life. It means he tells you what to do. It means you're not in charge anymore. When you accept Jesus as Savior, you also accept him as Lord. Isn't that, is, is that, am I mistaken on that, or is that right? Which means, then, that he has, the, he has the, the right and the responsibility to tell you how to live in everything. Because as the old saying goes, if Jesus isn't Lord of all, he isn't Lord at all. If you got stuff in your life that you're keeping from God and you're not allowing him to, to, to lead it and run it, well, he's not your Lord. You can't just let him have part of it. If, 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 if he doesn't own it all, then he's not your Lord. But if he is your Lord, that means he runs it all. He's in charge of it all. He tells you what to do and you do it. Guess what? You do it whether you like it or not whether you feel like it or not, whether it feels like it's going to make you happy or not. Because you no longer run your life. Does that make sense? So Jesus says, the kingdom of God has come to your doorstep. 
And he's saying, I want, you to, I want you to come in. But the first step, as you cross the threshold, the first step, the first thing you have to do before you step in is repent. And that means not only turning from your behavior that is, that is not glorifying to God, but it's also saying, henceforth, for all, future, for all time, from, from henceforth forever, I submit to God, I submit, Shane, to God, I forfeit my right, I suppose, to run my own life, and I give that to God. You now will tell me how to live. If you say jump, I say how high. No questions asked. And there's, there's no area of our lives that is more crucial for us to do this than in relationships. Because so often, the way we treat each other, the way we speak to each other, the way we act toward each other is guided by what I want to do. It's guided by how I feel. It's guided by what I think is fair. Well, John, you know, he, he talked bad about me, so I'm going to talk bad about him. Right? Sydney betrayed me. I'm done with her. David was rude to me. I'm going to be rude to him. That person, I mean, they're just, they're just, a, you know, they're just a, a black hole of need. They're just sucking life out of me. I got to get away from them. I, I run into it all the time, and you do too. Relationship situations where, where, where people are not willing to do what's right, not do, willing to do what glorifies God because their, their, their primary motivator is what makes them happy. But when you enter the kingdom of God, see again, keeping our eye on the end, where we're headed, where we're headed is a place of perfect relationships, a city where we're surrounded by people but the relationships are perfect. But the thing is, how, do, how, how does that happen? How do you have perfect relationships? What did Shane read earlier? Have this attitude in you, which was in Christ Jesus. Though he was God, he became a man. Though he was God, he laid down every right, privilege, and went from the throne to the cross. Your attitude should be like that. And that is the only way heaven comes to earth in relationships. By you saying, I no longer have the right to do what I want. Are you hearing me? You no longer have the right to do what you want if you have accepted Jesus as Lord. He is the boss. He is in charge. Not you. Period. So please, we've got to get over this, this stuff that we hear in culture all the time. I've got to do what makes me happy. That's crazy. That is, not, that is not in the Bible. That is not what Jesus tells us to do. You're going to do all kinds of things. If you follow Jesus, you're going to do all kinds of things that are not going to make you happy. Do you think Jesus was happy for probably the last half of his ministry? Did he do anything that made him happy? He may have been happy on occasion, but the vast majority of the things that he did, he did for you and for me self-sacrificially, completely self-sacrificially, it was never about him. And that's the only way relationships are going to be heavenly on earth, is if we give up this concept that I, that I can decide how I'm going to treat Sidney, that I can decide how I'm going to treat John, that I'm going to treat David how I feel and how it, however, however, however I think he deserves. Who gave you the right to determine what, what David deserves? <laughs> Jesus says, come follow me and do it my way. 
If you're going to accept me as Savior, you've got, you got to accept me as Lord. That means I run your life, not you. I want to just close with this example. In marriage. Because... <laughs> How many of you are married? Just raise your hand. Um, all you married folk, I've been married 19 years. All you married folks, if, have you ever had a time, I, you don't have to raise your hand or anything, but just, just think with me. Has there ever been a time in your married life where if you thought it was right to leave, you would have? Or you would have certainly considered it strongly. I have. Monica's not here, so I'm, <laughs> it's a freebie for me. <laughs> um, I, I think most, I think in most married relationships, and I, I know there are some exceptions, but in most married relationships, most of us get to a place occasionally where where. The emotions that you felt on, the, on your wedding day are gone. They're totally gone. You're not even sure you like this person anymore. Sometimes it gets so bad that your spouse begins to feel like your enemy. So this is a perfect example of what I'm talking about. So what does, God, what does Jesus say about how you treat your enemy? Love your enemy. How do you do that? It's like Chris will, I mean, I know that's what I'm supposed to do, but I don't feel anything for my husband anymore. I don't feel anything for my wife anymore. Exactly, that's the point. You can still choose to act in love, to treat your spouse with love, regardless of how you feel. That is obedience to Jesus. You see, if you say, well, the romance is gone, the feelings are gone, I'm not happy anymore, I'm out of here. Okay, well then, you're, then you are the Lord of your life. But if you say, I'm not happy anymore, the feelings are gone, the romance is gone, the things that I once felt I no longer feel, I don't even like them anymore. But what did, what did Paul say in, in Ephesians 5? He says, submit to one another out of what? Reverence for who? For Christ. So if Monica and I are in, in serious conflict... And I don't even really like her anymore. She doesn't like me anymore. You know what Jesus says? So what? That's irrelevant. I mean, it really is. How you feel about it is irrelevant. Because Monica may not deserve it. Chris may not deserve it. But Jesus sure does. So you treat your spouse in a way that honors Jesus. In a way that Jesus deserves. And you know what the beautiful thing is that happens? When you choose out of reverence for Christ, when the feelings are gone, and this is not just spouses, this is any relationship. This could be your coworker that annoys you to death. This could be your neighbor that you've had conflict with. It doesn't matter what the relationship is. This principle applies with every relationship. It's, it works the same everywhere. But, but with your spouse, what happens is the feelings are gone, the romance is gone. The spark's no longer there. But out of reverence for Christ, you choose to act in love toward them. You choose to treat them in loving ways, submitting, as Shane said, to Jesus. Because he's my Lord. And what my spouse deserves is not the point. It's what Jesus has called me to do. It's how he's called me to act and live. But here's the magic thing that happens. 
usually. When you begin to treat your spouse with love, and you begin to act toward your spouse in love, even when you don't feel it, what so often happens is that that division, that wall begins to come down, and guess what else will happen? The feelings will begin to return. See, if you are your Lord, then no more romance, no more spark. I don't even like this person. I'm out of here. I'm not happy. And sometimes we even church that saying up and say, and God wants me to be happy. Really? Really? So if you are your Lord, then you go get divorced. But if Jesus is your Lord, you begin to treat your spouse with love. You begin to act toward your spouse in love, regardless of how you feel about it. Is this easy? Of course it's not easy. It's incredibly hard. But if you're willing to do it, what happens is that you begin to break down those barriers and those walls that were between you and your spouse, and eventually the feelings come back. That's what happens when Jesus is Lord. Now, again, it may sound good for you to run your own life, but you tell me in the scenario that I just painted for you, which one's a better way? And I guarantee you it's that, it's that way with everything Jesus tells us to do. He's the one who made you. He knows how you work the best. If you will just listen to him in terms of how to do relationships, they will, just trust me, they will be so much better than whatever you cook up. <laughs> Don't you think? Is it so hard? Of course. It's incredibly hard to do that. Submission is tough. Laying down my rights, tough. Treating somebody in love when they have treated me with hate, tough. But man, if you will submit to the Lord and you will, and you will do that, I'm telling you, your relationships, every one of them will be different. And sometimes, you know, sometimes your spouse feels like your enemy, but sometimes, and all, you know, married people understand this too, there, there are also those moments when, you, when you're both acting the way I just described, in love and in submission, out of reverence for Christ. And, and, and you will experience those moments that really do feel like heaven. Because they're perfect. You will experience, in your marriage, if you're willing to do this, you will experience moments of perfection. When it's all right. It's all just right. And when you do that, you have brought heaven to earth. In our job, as people who are trying to live in the kingdom of God, is to make more and more and more of those moments a reality. Where more and more often we are bringing heaven to earth by the way we treat one another. It doesn't have to be as broken as it, as it is out there. And in, 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 in the people, the people that, the people in this room and others who, who are part of this faith community, our job, our job is to be a kingdom outpost to show the people out there what it looks like to bring heaven to earth. And more than any other way you do that, you do that by the way you treat each other. So in here, we're not gossiping. If you've, been, if you've been gossiping about people in this church, you need to repent of that. I'm, I'm serious. You really do. That's no good. That's, that's, uh, that's, that's not Christ-like. It tears down relationships. If you've been, if you've been critical, if you're, if you're one of those that sits, that sits back and never does anything and, then, and is critical of all the people who try to do something, well, you're wrong. You need to repent. That tears down, that tears down community. What we need
need to do is, is, is submit to our own rights and privileges and say, you know, how I feel about it is irrelevant. I'm going to submit to the Lord because he deserves it. And out of reverence for Christ, no matter how, I've, no matter how hateful I've been to David, he's going to treat me with love. Not because I deserve it, but because Jesus does. Right? And when we do that, the more we do that, the more we bring heaven to earth. That's the kingdom of God. Where the king rules and everybody submits to his authority and does it the way he tells us to do it. And I guarantee you, his way is so much better. So if you've, got, if you've got a relationship right now in your life that is filled with conflict, that's filled with hate, filled with strife or friction or anger, whether it's a spouse, whether it's a, a sibling, a parent, a child, a co-worker, a roommate, a neighbor, someone here in this church that you go to church with, whoever it may be, would you please, would you please very prayerfully ask the Lord to show you how to submit in that, how to show the love of Christ in that, how to stop, how to stop seeking your own way, how to stop thinking about what, what I think they deserve because, it, because of how they treated me, and instead, lay down your rights like Jesus did, lay down your privileges like Jesus did, and say, you know what, I love this relationship more than I love getting my way. And so I'm going to lay down my rights. I'm going to lay down my privileges so that David and I can love each other and be in relationship with each other. If he's wronged me, well, okay, so be it. Maybe the Lord will show him that eventually, and he'll make that right. But for right now, I just want to be in a relationship with David. So I'm going to do what I need to do on my side to make that possible. So that's the call today. If you've been in relationships where you've, you've lived through, fric where you're dealing with friction, anger, hurt feelings, all that, what if you were to lay that down, submit to the Lord, let him be in charge instead of you, and then see what happens. Let's pray. Lord God, would you, would you just give us the, the strength and the power to to submit and to love others and to love the relationships that we have more than our own rights, more than our own privileges. Lord, by the power of your Holy Spirit, would you strengthen us and give us the courage and the love and the ability, Lord, to engage in relationships in a way that, just like Jesus did, submitting and loving and serving for the sake of others. And Lord, if there's anybody here who's in who's in conflict in any of their relationships, Lord. May, may you bring healing, and may you show them how to, uh, to lay down their rights and privileges so that that relationship can possibly be restored. Lord, w would you make this church, would you make the Rimmel Church an outpost of your kingdom? And would you, uh, would you empower the people in this church, Lord, to love each other in such a way that they bring heaven to earth? And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. The last thing that Jesus said before he died, as he goes to the cross, or one of the last things as he went to the cross in the, in the garden, he said, Not my will, but yours be done. And those are your marching orders. Those are my marching orders. In relationships, the way we treat each other, and in everything else in life, not my will, that yours be done.